Well, good morning, church family. So good to be with all of you. So good to see you. Uh, it's been an exciting couple weeks in my family. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about marriage lately. Uh, this past weekend, uh, Laura and I had our 11th wedding anniversary. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's hard to believe it's been that many years, but it's, it's been good. We, we praise God. And in addition to that, we had the uh, privilege of officiating two weddings in the church, as you know, uh, Joey and Tamara and Brooke and Jonathan. By the way, can we welcome Mr. and Mrs. Connors back to our church? So good to see you guys. One of the things that we noticed is uh, when you're an engaged couple, uh, you're looking forward to, to getting married, it can be really deflating to, uh, to read marriage books. Am I right, you guys? Can you testify to this? Because almost any marriage book you read, you get to chapter one, and basically the message is, this will be the hardest thing you will ever do. Why would you want to do this? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like, gosh, this is deflating. I was all excited. Because you will argue about everything. Your, your, your personalities will be hard to mesh. Your family histories were all so different. And you'll argue about where to go out for dinner and what to watch on Netflix. And you'll argue about how to squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube. No kidding you, my, my best friend from high school, when he got married, when he got married their first marriage fight was how you slice the, or how you like slice the butter when you're toasting, toasting your, your bread. And uh, the wife said, no, you should do it kind of down at the edge, you know, vertically. And my friend, I was astonished, he said, no, you, you slice it horizontally <laughs> across the top. I said, buddy, you're insane. I don't know of anybody <laughs> who slices their butter like that when they toast their bread. But these are the kinds of arguments that married people have. You see, when you get married, you become one flesh, one family, one unity. It is a reality. It is a fact that exists that God has made the couple one. But it's equally true that your oneness of your marriage requires a lot of hard work to maintain. Now, I'm not preaching a marriage sermon today. I'm talking about Christ in the church. Today is Trinity Sunday, the day that we celebrate the inseparable unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the unity of the Trinity is the ground and model of the church's unity. And just like marriage, the unity of the church is a reality. It's brought into existence by God the Father through the grace of Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Before we do anything, when we are saved, we are grafted into this family, into the one people of God. That's why, that's why Paul says in our text this morning, he says, here's the truth. Here is the reality of your salvation. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Do you see the Trinity there, by the way? One spirit, one Lord Jesus Christ, one God. We're grafted into this one body by the Spirit. Our oneness is a reality. It exists by the grace of God. But just like marriage, it also requires a lot of hard work to maintain. Now, we're having a, a, member, a membership class tonight. Uh, several people have signed up to take our membership class, and I've, and I've kind of wondered, man, maybe I should start out membership class like these marriage books start out. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to scare anybody away from, from joining the church, but gosh, I think we all need to hear this. Becoming a member of the church is really hard. The honeymoon, fa honeymoon phase, it'll wear off. And you'll realize that we're just a bunch of ordinary people and there's a bunch of sinners here seeking the grace of Jesus Christ. You're going to have conflict, you'll, you'll be sinned against, your personalities will be hard to mesh, we'll all have different expectations about what this is supposed to be. You might argue about the toothpaste, I mean, worship styles or other kinds of ministry philosophies. Becoming a covenant member of a local church might be one of the hardest things you'll ever do. But just like marriage, I believe its fruits are worth it. Over the years, the mutual faithfulness one to another facilitates love, peace, joy, memories, and a stable place for the next generation to develop in their faith. I mean, who was blessed by Confirmation Sunday last Sunday? Wasn't that a great Sunday? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can give praise to God for that. It was, an, it was amazing. Uh, what really blessed me was seeing all the people up here the parents, the mentors, the hands being laid upon these confirmands. And, and, I, and I believe it's, it's the unity of the church, the rich relationships that have formed over the years that made uh, last week such a beautiful Sunday. 
The church is good. Being part of church is God's idea. He created it. He designed us to live as one body. But it's our job to do the work of maintaining that unity. So how do we do it? How do we maintain the oneness of the Spirit? Well, Paul, I think, gives us uh, five essentials to church unity. I'm going to go over each one uh, this morning. And the, the first essential to church unity is humility. We need humble hearts. Because, pr- why? Because pride is destructive. Pride is what exalts the self over others. Pride deems others as more imp- yourself more important than others, more talented, more skilled, more gifted. Pride looks to one's own interests, not to the interests of others. In fact, the Bible says God hates pride and actively opposes it, but He lifts up the humble. Humility, on the other hand, is lowliness of mind, lowliness of heart. It considers others more important than oneself. In fact, the the Greek culture, the Greco-Roman culture at that time, in fact, they despised humility. They did not consider humility as virtuous, as something to be imitated. As F.F. Bruce put it, it, humility was the crouching submissiveness of a slave. You don't want to be humble. You don't want to be humble. You see, Christianity actually turned this Greek word humility into a virtue because Jesus modeled it for us. He lived a life of humble service. John Stott writes, humility is essential to unity. Pride lurks behind all discord while the greatest, greatest single secret of concord is humility. So if you're dismayed, maybe at the lack of unity you see in the world or the lack of unity you see in the church, step one is to look into the mirror and to examine your own heart. Where have I exalted myself above others? Where have I put my wants, my ways, my opinions above those of others? Of course this is how you come. Sometimes we double down on things like that. And it's like, okay, let's step back. (laughs) Where am I exalting my way above those of others? Humility is the key to unlocking the door of unity. We have to be humble. The second key to unity is gentleness. Gentleness or meekness as sometimes it's translated. Uh, It is not weakness. It is restrained or controlled strength. This is a Greek word that is used for a domesticated animal. An animal that's learned to restrain itself. Now, I remember when my family first got a dog. And in the, in the early days, the dog, Piper was his name, little toy poodle. Anytime someone came over, bark, 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 jumping up and down, jumping, I mean, I mean, it was ridiculous. But over time, as the dog is trained, it, it, it learned, he learned to not act that way, to not bark when people come in. He learned that not everybody is a threat. In fact, in his older years, when people came in the door, he just sat on the couch and did nothing. That's a domesticated animal. Someone who has learned to restrain themselves. Gentleness is the ability to not lash out in anger or annoyance at others. Gentleness is the ability to not send the angry email It's the ability to seek to understand someone before casting judgment. Now, anger itself is not wrong. In fact, it's a good signal that maybe uh, there's something important to pay attention to there. But we must control our anger so that we do not wound or hurt others with it. In your anger, do not sin, Paul writes, and do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. If we're upset... If we're irritated, if we're displeased or annoyed with the actions of others in the church, which we know never happens, we must learn to channel our feelings into positive actions for the good of the body. Because if we aren't careful, these situations give the devil a foothold to drive a wedge between us and our brothers and sisters for whom Christ died. That's why Paul says, down in Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32, and I believe I, I have this up on the screen for you. It says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You know, I think gentleness is the ability to make the move from verse 31 to verse 32. That I, and gentleness is the 
the ability to, to get rid yourself of all that, that anger, the malice, the bitterness, the annoyance. And I'm not going to act out of that. I'm going to exercise gentleness, tenderness, compassion, care. Realize this is a fellow bro- brother and sister, a fellow human being made in the image of God. And I'm going to treat them the way that I would like to be treated. That's gentleness. These first two qualities, humility and gentleness, they are key to unity and they really form the heart of Jesus Christ, who is our model and our teacher. The third key to unity is patience and bearing with others. God is extremely patient with us. He is so patient with us. And in order to be the church, we have to be patient with others. We're all on the journey. And if you look inward, I think you might admit there are some parts of you that aren't yet sanctified. Maybe some some habits that you haven't mastered or haven't gotten rid of yet. And this is true about you, despite the fact that you have been a Christ follower for years. Despite the fact that you've been a Christ follower for even decades. And yet, has God abandoned you? Has God given up on you because you aren't yet the person He wants you to be fully? in every way? No. He loves you and He is willing to work with you. He is so patient and kind with us in all of our weaknesses, even in our sins. So can we not be patient with others as God has been so patient with us? To be patient with others requires bearing with them. This is a word that means enduring. I like that because it's so realistic. Sometimes you just have to hang in there. With people. Sometimes you just have to endure it. One scholar says this word, it involves not ceasing, not ceasing to love one's neighbors or friends because of those faults in them which perhaps offend or displease us. Again, that's so realistic. I appreciate how realistic the Bible is. It's a very truthful book. It's realistic about human nature. It's realistic about ourselves. It's realistic about the church. And this word that's used for enduring, it sometimes is used for enduring persecution. Wow. Now, I hope being a part of the church doesn't feel like you're enduring persecution. I think we're doing a little better than that. (laughs) But we are called to bear with the faults of others. Sometimes we sin, sometimes we're quirky, sometimes we say or do things we shouldn't. Oftentimes things don't go perfectly, things and systems break down. We're human. We're simply human. And if we give up on each other because of our weaknesses and our shortcomings, we cannot be united. There's a fable about uh, some porcupines who, in the middle of a very frigid blizzard, they had to figure out a way to stay warm together. So they, they huddled together in a cave to stay warm. But as they huddled together, you know what happens? They pricked each other with their needles. But then they, so they said, okay, no, I need to distance myself from the other porcupines, but when they distanced themselves from the others, they grew cold. And they realized, despite all the hurts, I can't survive without huddling together with the other porcupines. And I suggest to you, this is an image of what it's sometimes like to be in the church. God designed us for community, but we also get hurt in community. And that may cause us to withdraw or to distance ourselves, whether that's physically or emotionally, from other people. But our survival, our vibrancy in the faith, our warmth is dependent upon community. Yes, hurts come from community, but that's where also where healing comes from as well. That's where God often works, the healing process. So we, we must accept that all of us, myself included, including yourself, that we're all a bunch of porcupines trying to get warm. That's what the church is, a bunch of porcupines trying to get warm at the fire of Christ. And I think that the church, it's beautifully imperfect, and this must be accepted, and sometimes it can even be appreciated. We can learn to appreciate the shortcomings and the quirks of other people sometimes. In fact, I, I think God works through these weaknesses. I thank God that I'm weak. I thank God that the church is weak. Because it shows that the power that holds us together is not ourselves, but God. It's dependent upon Him. He is the one that has made our unity a reality. And it's simply our job just to keep maintaining it. We don't have to create it. God did that. 
we maintain the unity of the Spirit. And it's His power that holds us together, not our own. So it's simply our job to be patient, to bear with others along the journey, and to help others keep warm. The fourth key to unity is a zealous effort to maintain unity. A zealous effort. If you're following along, along in your Bibles, this is a, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Paul says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. As we said, God has, made, has brought about the unity of the Spirit, but it's our job to maintain it, and that work is never done. We don't arrive somehow at unity. We don't arrive at community. These are ongoing practices. It's not something we find or discover. It's something we build and work towards. I think we ought to think of unity not so much as a noun but as a verb. It's something we practice. The Greek word here for make every effort, it's an urgent call to spare no effort in this task. The scholar Marcus Bart says this about it, It is hardly possible to render exactly the urgency contained in this verb. Not only haste and passion, but a, a full effort is meant involving will, sentiment, reason, physical strength, and total attitude. It excludes passivity, quietism, a wait-and-see wait attitude. Yours is the initiative. Do it now. Mean it. You are to do it. I mean it. These are the overtones of verse 3. Make every effort. And again, if, if God has done this, if God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to do this, if this was Jesus' literal prayer for the church in John 17 that Ben preached for us a couple weeks ago so nicely, if this was Jesus' prayer for us, how can we not make every effort in maintaining the unity of the Spirit. This is what our Lord desires to bring about and for us to practice. This is not a uniformity that stamps out all individuality, but it, it does mean, I think, we, we ought to believe the best about each other. To refrain from judgment, complaining, dissensions, any form of gossip, slander, or accusation. We ought to refrain from arguing and bitterness and the like. And if something is amiss, we ought to bring it directly to the person concerned or through the appropriate channels. And we encourage others also, when we see it, to practice direct communication. I think we have to resolve that conflict is normal, conflict is expected, and we have to learn how to resolve it quickly and in healthy ways. Um, in fact, I think one of the best things that you could do for yourself, that you could do for those around you, you could do for the church, is to buy a good book on how to resolve conflict. One of my favorites is Crucial Conversations. It's a great, great book. I highly recommend it. Go to Amazon, wherever you shop for books, pick it up, do yourself a favor, and your friends and your family and your church will thank you because we have to learn how to resolve this in healthy ways. But maintaining unity is not just about resolving conflict. It's also about the positive pursuit of healthy, warm, and loving relationships. Making the effort to participate in groups, to be here in person on Sunday morning, to go on retreats, to participate in the life of community. It's necessary to spend time with one another, to develop that unity in those warm relationships. You know, I tell married couples to guard the unity of their marriage, to spend time together, to make sure you're building, continuing to build into that relationship. You see, our oneness is maintained by intentional pursuit of relationship. It's the same within the church. So we must be zealously committed to the unity of, of our church, but also to the church around the world, realizing that there are brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ's body is global and universal, and an ecumenical spirit is essential to unity as well. So finally, let me get to the last essential to unity, number five, using your gifts to serve others. Using your gifts to serve others. Verse 7 said, to each one, uh, grace is given. Uh, and then jumping down to verse 11, Jesus himself granted that some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity and, the, to the full, and to the measure of the full stature of Christ. So how do we build unity? How do we make effort in maintaining unity? It's, bu it's built as each person 
is activated to use their Holy Spirit-empowered gifts to build up the church. And many of you do that. We have such an active and engaged, involved congregation. I'm so thankful for that. And it's, and it's also true that we have to keep working on it. We have to keep maintaining it, keeping everyone activated in their gifts. You know, I think it's a sad fact today. I think this is true that this is just by anecdotal experience. I think many Christians today, they are more aware of their Enneagram than they are of their spiritual gifts. We're more aware of our Myers-Briggs or all those personality tests than we are of the spiritual gifts that are in Scripture, in the Word of God. And I think that's true, and I'm sorry to say this, I say this with all gentleness. I think this is true because we're far more interested in in ourselves than we are serving. Because your personality is about yourself, and spiritual gifts are about serving others. So which one are we going to be more inclined to naturally? You know, I think that's why there's this imbalance. Now, I'm not saying personality stuff is helpful. I've taken all the tests five, six, or seven times. In fact, those can be immensely helpful in learning how to resolve the conflicts we have because we realize other people think and experience life differently than we do. So I'm not knocking those. But it's the imbalance of are we aware of how the Spirit is prompting and empowering and gifting us to build up the body of Christ? We need to be aware of that. Because when we serve, the church grows. When we serve, we maintain unity. When we serve, we build up the body. When we serve, we build up our own maturity and our relationship with God. And I think that's part of fighting hard against a consumeristic mentality. You know, I've heard one pastor say, you know, we're not, we're not consumers, but we are spiritual contributors to the kingdom of God. We are spiritual contributors to the kingdom. So if you're sitting there throughout your week and you realize, gosh, there, there, there is something in our church that just needs to be done. This is, this is missing. There's a needed ministry within the body. You know, perhaps that is the Spirit prompting you into ministry, or perhaps it's the Spirit is prompting you to recruit others alongside you who might be feeling or gifted to do the same thing. So let Pastor Zach's or I know it's our job to equip you to coordinate with you, to coordinate with others, to resource you so that the ministry of faith covenant can thrive and excel. You see, if the church is a game, it's not like the staff is on the field and y'all are in the stands. It's more we're on the sidelines coordinating, coaching, supporting all of you who are on the field playing the game. That's how it's supposed to work. That's what we're going after in our church. In fact, that's one of our church values that every member is a minister the total ministry of faith covenant is all of y'all. What each person contributes to building up the body and extending the kingdom of Jesus. And when you do that, when you use your gifts to build up the body, unity, maturity, and growth is formed in all of us. So friends, our unity is a gift. It's grounded in the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. So if we've been saved, if we've, we are, by Christ, we are baptized into this one people of God. And now it's our job to do the hard work of maintaining the unity of the Spirit. So I call upon you. I call upon each of you. I call upon anyone who's listening to me online, as the Spirit leads you, to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Be humble. Be gentle. Be patient with and bear with others. Forgive them as Christ has forgiven you and use whatever gifts you have to build up Christ's body until he calls you home. So as you go forth this week, I just want to leave you with one question to meditate on. What is is one thing? What is one thing you could do this week even to maintain the unity of the church?